1090 in here, GKB with me. 1090 Jake is a very interesting person that's coming into the hip hop space with the quickness because he's a gangster blogger. Whereas most of the guys who report in hip hop are suburban geeky type of guys, 1090 is an official blood that has done prison time in some of the worst prisons in Florida and has a lot of respect in the streets, giving him a unique point of view. The fact that he's even a blood is very impressive since bloods are a black gang. Do you know what type of stuff you need to be into as a white guy to get into a black gang? Let's get into it. It's 1090 Jake, man. I'm rocking with y'all, and y'all rocking with me. Jacob Daniel Cherry, aka 1090 Jake, was born August 8, 1994, in Malden, Massachusetts, which is basically a small town outside of Boston. His upbringing started off rocky since his parents split up before he was even born. His own mother didn't even show up to his birth. Damn. As a kid, his parents seemed to always be fighting, creating a hostile environment for him, which implemented certain things in his brain, which made him go down the path of destruction. Plus, his dad was an Italian gangster, so it's in his blood. In elementary, he was a class clown that didn't do any school schoolwork, but he didn't really start getting into trouble until middle school. Around this time, he was living with his dad and he first got introduced to the idea of being a blood by an older friend who was already official. Because he was getting in trouble a lot in Boston, the adults in his life had the great idea to send him down to Florida. Yes, Florida. Jake has expressed that when he first moved to Florida, he was an angry, insecure kid, which made this a recipe for disaster. His first year there, he lived with his grandmother and attended eighth grade, where he would get into more trouble since grandmas can't really discipline like that. But because of this, he moved to Tampa with his aunt. Here, he would attend Brooks de Bartolo Collegiate High School his freshman year. The kids there would try to pick on him for being white, and Jake, being the young gangster that he is, wasn't going for it. He explained that he got into a lot of fights at school and acted out, but was able to gain some respect. This same school year, he would get into popping pills, drinking drink, and smoking that Zaza. At 15 years old, my guy was off the chain. If that wasn't enough, he was investigated for selling X pills and guns at school. Because of all that, he went to Chamberlain High School his sophomore year. Here, he would get in more fights, smoke at the school, get suspended for a weapon, and another suspension for drinking on campus. Basically, anything you shouldn't be doing, he did. Around this time, he would start hanging with the wrong people, or in Jake's eyes, the right people. Bloods. Jake says Tampa is a blood city, which makes sense, look at their sports team. Eventually, he would get his put on, put on meaning that the other gang members beat the shit out of you for a couple minutes. For him, it was probably worse since he's white. He really had to prove himself, but Jake didn't give a heck. At 16 years old, he went to juvie for a gun case, which he beat, but got a felony assault during his time in juvie, meaning he put another kid in the hospital. Anywhere this kid went, it was some shit going down. He eventually said forget school, I'm gang banging full time and dropped out his junior year on four. 20. The Zaza must have gotten to him. I remember the smells that came with it. Mm. The smell of the blood, the sounds of the person gurgling on their shit. Now let's get into the reason why he went to prison. It's actually a pretty messed up story, but a family friend who tried to mentor Jake had a ton of guns and would even take Jake to the shooting range. And what did Jake do? Rob him for all his guns. Stories like these really break my heart, but it has a good ending. Jake was introduced to a guy who would be his partner in crime, and they both did the robbery together. They suited up, drove to the house, knocked to make sure it was empty, and besides two chihuahuas, the coast was clear. They went in through the back, where there was a sliding door that led to the master bedroom. Lucky for them, the doors locked was faulty and all they had to do was finagle the door to get in. Under the mattress, they found two guns and in the closet, they found two duffel bags. Jackpot. A total of 15 guns worth almost 9 grand in total. They were able to get everything and drive off. Some time passed and it would seem like they got away with it until his partner in crime had to mess it all up. Let's call him Cody for co-defendant. Cody would accidentally shoot a gun in his apartment. Police were called and once they showed up, they smelled Mary Jane, which in the state of Florida allows them to search the place. They found two guns that were registered to the guy they stole them from and boom cody's fucked around the same time an 18 year old 1090 jake who was walking out of a party would get stopped and searched because someone pointed them out as saying they were trying to steal a car they found a gun on him and booked him he was already worried enough since the gun had hollow points and missing bullets little did he know that was light in jail his charges would change dramatically he had a total of 19 felonies 15 for each of the guns he stole one for armed robbery one for concealed carry and another for being a white blood. Nah, I'm just kidding. The last one was for grand theft, meaning he stole something worth more than five grand. So basically another felony for the guns. The crazy part is he really shouldn't have been caught for this, but Cody got in that interrogation room and snitched. This is probably where his hatred of snitches comes from because Cody was dumb enough to get caught with the guns and then to get a reduced sentence told on a person that they didn't even know existed. That's MVP snitching. This is why I commit all my crimes on my own. Stay by myself. Ain't gotta worry about a nigga telling. At this point, he's in county based 
basically seeing what the deal is, waiting on the courts, hanging out with his bloodas, and he would have his first TOH or test of heart when a blood named Solo would call him out. Now this dude didn't just have hands. Dude had hands and feet because Jake didn't know what happened when that Velcro Reebok hit him in the face. Dude was on him, but Jake ain't no bitch. He channeled his inner Brock Lesnar and fought back. He says he didn't win, but it was a test to see if he was pussy or not. From then on, Solo and Jake were cool. Back at the courts, he would get a deal. His charges were reduced. Instead of 19 felonies, he would get charged with armed robbery, one count of grand theft of a firearm, grand theft, and carrying a concealed weapon. This was a sweet deal considering he was facing life, but got three years instead. After this, it was prison time, which is where Jake really became the man he is today. Because he was young when he got charged, he went to a youth offender prison, which is real prison, but for people ages 14 to 24, for, which is worse because you're in a prison with a ton of young guys trying to get their rep up and they still have a lot to prove. He would definitely have a lot of tests but was heavily embraced by the Bloods after they saw he had heart. Even the CEOs were very suspicious of a white boy that had respect of the Bloods. He moved around to a total of three prisons. When he got to the next one, he would get constantly beat on by guards. At one point, when he had an ingrown toenail, the guards started stomping on his toes because they wanted him to tell. But Jake's too solid for that. But yeah, the guard shit is actually crazy. I can't even put the videos up because it's that graphic. But I'll link to a post of 1090s that shows on the video the type of shit the guards would be on. Someone's gotta fix that. And a lot of inmates would starve because the food wasn't edible. Only people with common could eat good so the tough guys would extort people for food especially 1090 since he didn't have anyone sending him money so you basically had to watch out for cob downs prison beefs all while starving if that doesn't deter you from wanting to go to prison i don't know what will now let's get into this infamous picture in which he got a buck 50 meaning a cut to the face this was at lake butler which is not a prison it's more of a prison hospital here the head honcho of the bloods was originally a sur 13 member but dropped his flag and started cripping and then decided to be blood. Yeah, I don't know how that works, but he would try to tell Jake that the GDs and Bloods are an alliance. Big no-no. Jake wasn't going for it, especially since he knew this guy was fraudulent. And with the quickness, the Blood put a $50 bound on his head. $50, bro. For 1090 Jake's head, you gotta pay at least three figures. Anyways, when they were in line, a GD pushed the issue and gave him a quick slice to the face and ran into the room where the COs were so Jake couldn't get to him. Jake told the COs that he fell and hit his head on the rail, but the COs didn't like this answer, which is when the COs would stomp on his ingrown nail. SMH. Jake has a ton of stories from his time in prison. These aren't even the wildest ones. You can check them out on his YouTube channel, End of Sentence. But luckily, Jake was able to survive his three years and get out. It's 1090 Jake, man. I'm rocking with y'all and y'all rocking with me. At this point, Jake is a gatekeeper of gangsterism and the Supreme Court when it comes to snitching. But let's take it all the way back to how he got into YouTube in the first place. After being released from Appalachia CI, he only spent 24 hours in Florida before moving to Boston. A family member, I'm assuming it was a parent, told him that he could live with them, but almost immediately kicked him out. So Jake would sign up for drug programs in order to have somewhere to stay, but he wasn't actually addicted. Eventually, he moved in with his girlfriend at the time, but in 2016, he would get arrested for sticking someone up with a gun and got charged with assault with a deadly weapon. But since this was in Massachusetts and not Florida, JIT was able to get probation for two and a half years. This was a good thing in the end because he was forced to get a job and worked at a smoke shop, which helped him get his life on track. And on October 2nd, 2017, he fathered a baby girl. In 2019, when he was around 26, he would go on a Prison Stories YouTube channel called 23 and one Lockdown. He told the people about his experience in prison and because of a combination of his good storytelling, being a white blood, and the absolute horror stories during his prison time, his interview blew up. Today it has 1.7 million views and is the most watched interview on that channel. This would influence Jake to start his own YouTube channel, End of Sentence. He would originally talk more about his experiences in prison or other prison stories, then he would start to bring people on to tell their story, but he really popped off when he started talking about rappers and their gangster credibility and beefs, but most importantly for calling people out for their faulty paperwork. And that's the key word in 1090's videos, paperwork. He had his first viral moment when he called out Pino for snitching. Pino is also a white guy who is in a black gang, the Hoovers, but Jake would expose him to be a rat and they met in Boston and fought. Pino did beat 1090 Jake because he was wearing brass knuckles. The video of the fight did come out which went somewhat viral which helped Jake because he went crazy with the content and eventually landed an interview on the coolest podcast in the world. It's No Jumper's second most watched interview with 5.5 million views. The first being the X interview with 21 million views. But that's like an artist going diamond after dying. So the argument could be made that the 1090 Jake interview is really number one. But because he was doing big things on YouTube and made a shit ton of money, he took some time off 
but has recently come back with even more ammo. And most notably recently called out O3 Greedo for snitching on his most recent case. Which is crazy since O3 is a beloved rapper and all rap fans were excited for his return from prison. But of course, this just made him bigger. At this point, he has one of the highest opinions on street politics, being up there with Boosie Badass and Charleston White, and he's always trying to expose rats. But that's the story. I think 1090 Jake is very entertaining, so I'm a fan. Drop a comment down below and let me know what y'all think.